Hello, I'm Professor Daniel Orquiza. This is our second lecture on our series of lectures on photonic devices, and today we're going to discuss band diagrams and crystal structure in solids. Just as a recap of our first lecture, uh, this course will ma mainly focus on op optoelectronic devices and phenomena, especially regarding the interaction of photons with charge carriers like electrons and holes. Also, we're going to cover electrical and optical properties of materials. And we are going to talk a little bit about the structure and design of basic photonic or optoelectronic devices, such as lasers, LEDs, and photodiodes. So we're going to go a little bit into the design. Uh, we're not going to talk, however, about the fabrication technology of these devices. Most of the semiconductors that we're going to be interested in, um, they have a crystalline structure. So what does this mean? So basically, it means that the atoms are arranged in a periodic lattice in three-dimensional space. So for example, you have basic lattice structures such as simple cubic, where the atoms are at the vertices of the unit cell. Uh, you have the body-centered cubic, where besides the vertex atoms, you have one atom right at the center of the unit cell. You also have the face-centered cubic, where you have the, the atoms at the, at the vertices, as well as six atoms right at the faces of the unit cell. So if we want to estimate how many electrons you have per unit cell, we can go about the, the following line of thought. So every atom at, at the vertices is shared by eight cubic cells. Okay, so you have four below and four above. So if you consider this atom here, it is shared by eight cells. That means that the contribution of such an atom is one eighth. Uh, in face centered cubic, every atom, which is located right at the face, is shared by two cells, one on each side. So the contribution of the atoms that are positioned at the faces is one half only. So for example, in FCC, we can estimate that the number of atoms per cubic cell is, so you have eight atoms at the vertices, so eight times the contribution of each atom, which is one eighth, plus six atoms at the face multiplied by one half, as we just saw. So you, you have on average four atoms per unit cell. Semiconductors such as silicon and gallium arsenide have a little bit more complex crystal structure. So, for example, silicon has a diamond crystal structure, which is illustrated right here, and gallium arsenide has a zinc blend crystal structure, which is similar, but in between the gallium atoms, you have an, one arsenide atom, whereas in silicon, you just have silicon atoms everywhere. So let's consider silicon, for example. Silicon has a lattice constant of 0 0.543 nanometers, so 5.43 angstroms, which is the lateral dimension here of the crystal cell. And aside from having eight atoms right at the vertices and six atoms at the faces, which you can see right here, uh, it has four additional atoms. So these atoms are this one right here, this one back here, this one back here, and this one right here. So these atoms are entirely within the, the unit cell, okay? So we have to account for these four additional atoms as well. So silicon with these additional four atoms per unit cell has a total of eight atoms. So we saw that the contribution of the vertex uh, atoms plus the face atoms was four. If we sum that to these other four here, we get eight. So therefore, we can estimate the electron concentration in the valence band using this information. Okay, the first thing we need to calculate is the unit cell volume. So we just we just take the cube of the last lattice parameter, the la lattice constant, which we just saw was about half a nanometer, right? If we, if we cube this, we get 1.25 times 10 to the minus 20 seconds centimeter cubed. So this is the volume of the unit cell in cubic centimeters. Each atom will have four valence electrons, right? Silicon has four electrons in the valence band, which means that, that silicon has four valence electrons. So if we multiply the number 
of valence electrons in each atom, right? So four valence electrons per atom times the number of effective atoms per unit cell, which we, uh, as we just saw, is eight, eight atoms per cell, and divide these numbers of electrons per unit cell by the volume of the, the unit cell, we get the effective uh, concentration of electrons per unit volume. So doing the math here, we get 2.6 times 10 to the 23rd electrons per centimeter cubed. So these are valence electrons. So this is an important information. So why is this an important number? Well, it's important because this gives us an order of magnitude of how many electrons are in the valence band. And these are electrons that, as we will see, can potentially gain energy and rise to the conduction band and be used for conducting electricity. So solid state is the state of matter where the atoms are most closely packed. If you compare a solid with a liquid or a gas, the atom density in a solid is much larger. And when you're looking into the motion of electrons inside a solid, you need to solve the Schrodinger equation, okay? So essentially the electron inside the solid is going to behave like a wave. So the Schrodinger equation is a wave equation, much like the wave equation that dictates the propagation of light uh, in electrodynamics, which is obtained, of course, from Maxwell's equation. This is, in a similar way, is a wave equation where you have to, to solve for the energy E and psi, which is the wave function, okay? It also can be looked as um, an equation for the conservation of energy. This term right here, the first term on the left-hand side, is associated with the kinetic energy. This term right here with the potential energy. Also in this equation, m is the mass of the electron, 9.1 times 10 to the minus 31 kilograms. H bar, which, which is the modified Planck's constant, is h divided by 2 pi, which is 6.58 times 10 to the minus 16 electron volt seconds. So in the Schrodinger's equation, E is the energy of the particle in the system, which in our case is the energy of the electron. And psi of R, where R is the position, which in um, Cartesian coordinates could be x, y, z, or in spherical coordinates could be R, theta, and pi. So psi is the wave function. Now, what is the meaning of the wave function? The, the wave function is going to be a function that is going to behave in such a way that you can get from it the probability of finding the electron at position r. So if, if you take the absolute value of psi, the absolute value of the wave function and square it, this quantity is going to be the probability density of finding the electron at position r in space. Okay, um, we're going to look into a few depictions of some wave functions in space and hopefully this will make a little bit more sense. But, for example, if you take the isolated hydrogen atom and solve Schrodinger's equation for it, you will find the electron's orbitals, okay, which are going to be associated with the respective wave functions and energies that the electrons can assume in that system. So in that case, the potential energy is going to be the Coulomb electrostatic potential energy, right? So charge squared divided by 4 pi epsilon naught times r. So this is the potential energy which is um, obtained from classical electrostatics, right? And if you plug V given by this equation into Schrodinger's equation right here, and so for psi and E, you are going to find the eigenenergies and the associated wave functions of the different states which the electron can assume in the hydrogen atom. Okay, so the eigen energy or the discrete energy levels um, which the electron can assume and the associated probability distribution of finding the electrons or in a more informal way the electron orbitals. So
that's what you get by solving the um, Schrodinger's equation with this potential energy function. Um, so, as a recap, for each electron, this function, okay, the absolute value of psi squared, is a function of space which is going to give you the probability of finding the electron at a given position in space as a function of the spatial coordinates. So, in the classical model, we thought of the electrons as spinning around the nucleus, much like the planets orbit around the sun in our solar system. So, you, you have a translational movement. The electrons revolve around the positively charged nucleus. In the modern or quantum mechanical model, on the other hand, the electron orbits are, are much more like clouds with varying density around the positively charged nucleus. And the way that these orbits are obtained is by solving Schrodinger's equation to obtain the wave function psi in such a way that the absolute value square of psi is plotted here corresponding to these different orbits. So the way to look at this is that since this is the probability density, in the lighter regions you have less chance or less probability of finding the electron, and in the darker region you have a higher probability. So the, the, in fact, the darker the region or the point, the, the larger the probability density. Okay? So that's the information that you have regarding the electron's position, only probability density function. And uh, these probability densities or these orbitals correspond to different energy values. The quantum mechanical model is the one that we know nowadays to be backed up by experimental data. If you're familiar with uh, electrodynamics and particularly guided wave theory, you'll notice that these orbitals resemble mathematically, of course, um, the guided modes of an optical waveguide. So in a waveguide or in a resonator, for example, you confine light to a given spatial region, the inside part of your waveguide. So in a similar way, the electron, which here behaves like a wave, since its behavior is described by a wave equation, Schrodinger's equation. So you're going to have modes, but we have to be mindful that this analogy is only a mathematical one. So you should not be surprised that since we're, we're solving uh, a wave equation and the electron is constrained to be, by the potential function, constrained to be around the, the nucleus that you're going to have uh, modes of spatial distribution for this way. This is just a way to, to look at it and perhaps it can allow us to get a better grasp of what the orbitals mean. So associated with each probability distribution, probability density function that we just saw, there is a discrete energy level which can also be solved for by solving Schrodinger's equation. So this, for example, is the energy values associated with the orbitals of the hydrogen atom. Um, these energy values are quantized. So by varying the index n here, you will get different discrete energy values. But the fact that they are quantized is related to the quantum part of quantum mechanics. And so you do not have a continuum of energy values which the electron can have or can assume. So you'll have only discrete or quantized values. So if we look at the energy of the electron for the hydrogen atom, instead of seeing a continuum of values, you are only going to see um, discrete values or quantized values. And as we've noticed from the equation on the last slide, these values are negative. And an energy equals to zero corresponds to a free electron which is infinitely far from the nucleus. In other words, it has been freed or released from the nucleus. 